Right, we're of course on the eve of a new Premier League season. Hope springs eternal. We've all got a spring in our step as we all start to think about that eternal question. How on earth are we going to win the Premier League? <laughs> yes, uh, fortunately, we have just the man to help mm. us with the answer of that one because we are joined uh, by Ian Graham, former head of research at Liverpool Football Club and author of the book, How to Win the Premier League. The inside story, Ian, of football's data revolution, which is out online and in bookstores today. Great to have you with us on the couch. Look, first question, what's the answer? How do you win the Premier League? Uh, the, the, the best guarantee of winning the Premier League is to make sure that you work for Manchester City. <laughs> they're, they're, a, they're an outstanding team and it's incredibly difficult to win the Premier League if you're anyone other than Manchester City. That's the book then, one page special. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, you that's, go. that's, that's the secret. Liverpool fans are going to like that one, Ian, are they? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, to be more serious about it, I think um, it takes a lot of time and effort, some investment as well. Building a squad with a chance of winning the title uh, is a process that needs to take several several years. We did that at Liverpool. You see Arsenal have done something similar now, so they're now in with a chance, a much higher chance than a, than a few years ago. But, yeah, a lot of hard work and investment. Yeah, it's, it's something that you know all about, something uh, in your time at Liverpool that Liverpool did. Uh, is that, am I right in saying that? So, I mean, you're the best man to talk about it. Yeah, I was there from 2012 till 2023. So um, tell, yeah. tell us about the role as well, because I asked you just before you came on. But you know, head of research covers what, and and how big a team did you have working in that research department? Yeah, so research is um, was basically any data that was to do with the football performance side of the club. Um, that was my team's job was to ingest it, store it, analyse it, feed it back to. Uh, the sporting director and to the coaches to give some insight about improving performance, mm. um, and that comes that that can be um, performance as to what's happening on the on the pitch, tactics. Uh, it could be physical performance of the players. Is data the most important thing in football now? Do you think in some ways? Uh, no, no. So the the most important thing is the players. Um, typically, if you've got the best players, you've got the best chance of winning the league. Data's just a tool, just like scouting's a tool, just like coaching's a tool. It's a tool to help you identify and help you get the best out of those players. But really, it all comes down to the players. So we just help a little bit in identifying and optimising the performance of the players. Mm. There have been huge changes at Liverpool this summer. Obviously, Jurgen Klopp, we all know about, but behind the scenes as well, Michael Edwards returns to the football club. Richard Hughes is there as a sporting director. Um, can, can you shed some light on, on how the sort of the analytical department will work with, with those guys and, and Arna Slot for the new season? Yeah, I think it's the case of um, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, uh, because um, as far as I understand it, the structure of the club is very similar to how it was before. So Richard Hughes stepped into Michael Edwards' old uh, role. My old colleague, Will Spearman, stepped into my old role there. And so as far as I understand, data is informing performance and informing recruitment mm. in, in the same way that it always did when I was there. Are there any of the players there now that you, you're proud that your data sort of helped to capture and it proved to pay off for the club? Yeah, absolutely. We were lucky enough to sign some brilliant, uh, brilliant players, and data, data played a part in that, along along with scouting. Um, so, it, you know, Mo Salah is a boring answer because um, everyone sees what a brilliant player he is. Um, but you know, Liverpool managed to sign him, and he didn't go to another Premier League club. It's a good answer though, because he'd already sort of been tried and almost failed in the Premier League at Chelsea, yeah. hadn't he? And so when he signed for Liverpool, that's where you've got to go with the data isn't it? Mm -hmm. Someone like Salah and go, mm -hmm. look, well, all this would, would suggest he's going to be perfect and it's been spot on. Yeah, so in, in the book I talk about that, um, that failure of Mo at uh, Chelsea and um, there's a chapter about why transfers fail and what, what we did at Liverpool was to try and understand what went wrong for him at Chelsea and it was really simple. What went wrong for him at Chelsea was Eden Hazard was uh, the first choice player in his position. He's one of the best players in the world at the time. So as a 21-year-old coming into Chelsea, of course you're not going to start if Hazard's the first choice player. Mm. So we were very comfortable having like looked at the data to understand he basically had a really good reason why he didn't get the minutes at Chelsea. So we kind of discounted that Chelsea failure, paid a lot more attention to what he'd done uh, at Rome and at Fiorentina, where he was already one of the best young yeah. wide forwards in, uh, in Europe. 
I think you know a lot of the data and stats and research guys I speak to, they, they hate the comparison of Moneyball because it's such an easy sort of, um, but it makes it relevant to our audience in terms of lo looking at sort of facts and figures and how you would identify players. And you were, of course, there when they sold Philip Coutinho and released a, a hell of a lot of money to, to really reinvent Liverpool Football Club, weren't you? And, and, and identified what they needed to take it to the next step. Yeah, yeah, we didn't tend to use the money ball word at <laughs> Liverpool because it is a bit of a cliche and it's also sort of being a bit uh, a bit misrepresented as being cheap mm. and it's not really about being cheap it's just about trying to get the maximum amount of performance per pound spent so you know uh, Liverpool did spend heavily on Van Dijk and uh, Alisson as Coutinho's replacements we we're happy to spend the, those large transfer fees because we believe the performances that we get from those players mm. will push the team to the next level so it's all about trying to maximise uh, the bang for your back if you like. Mm. Any players that while you were there, you know, did, you, you provided the data, the scouting, everyone was aligned, you thought, oh, this is one we're going to go for, but you didn't quite manage to get it over the line? The, the one that I always, um, I always look back on with uh, some regret was in, I think it, it was summer 2013, um, we made a bid for Diego Costa, who was at Atletico Madrid at the time. Yes. Um, and he was a player that could play uh, wide forward, he could play centre forward. He was built to play in the Premier League, as we saw a few years later with Chelsea. Um, and yeah, we thought it was going to happen, but he decided to stay at Atletico. So um, at Spurs, he was uh, at Liverpool, sorry, he was the one that got away. Yeah. I worked for Tottenham Hotspur for a few years before that, and uh, they had a chance to sign Mesut Ozil, and that got away from them in 2009 or 2010. Mm. So that could have been a slightly different history for Spurs as yeah. well. There's yeah. loads of stories in the book, and, and, and obviously about the signing of Sadio Mane as well. So, so when you're signing a, a player like him, how much of a sort of package do you build together and then sit down you know, with the manager and go, this is what we think, this is what you think, let's put it together. You know, it, that was an easy one to convince the boss. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so Jurgen um, was great to work with because his idea of what a good player was was often really in line with what the statistics were saying about players. So it made made our job very easy. And Mane was a player that um, Jurgen had always liked from when he was Dortmund uh, boss as, as well. Uh, Mane's stats looked excellent mm. from the scouting and video work that's, that's also done. You can't sign a player only based on data. You still need to do uh, your scouting job. He ticked ne nearly every box. The only one he didn't tick was um, uh, we'd received some kind of negative feedback about maybe he was a bit of a difficult character. Was he going to cause problems at the club? And that sort of personal side you need to worry about when you sign a player. Are there any stats for that? <laughs> well, it's difficult. It's a judgment call. Yeah. Thankfully, it was my boss that had to make that judgment call rather than me. And it was interesting that, we, you know, we decided that Manny was a good enough player. We weren't going to pay too much attention to those negative reviews on the personal side. But then when Mane arrived, he was one of the most intelligent, yeah. caring, um, really decent players that we, we'd ever signed. So those sort of bad reports we'd heard about him yeah. just weren't true. You know, the quality of the evidence wasn't there. And so it's always a, diff a difficult thing to sort of weigh up this subjective opinion about a player with all of the more objective performance. I'm just thinking as well, there were so many players that came from Southampton during that period, weren't there? And, you know, I mean, even going back a bit further with Ricky Lambert and, you know, Adam Lallana and off the top of my head, you know, obviously Virgil van Dijk afterwards. Did yeah. that become a bit of a, a sort of talky pull? Like you just hacked Southampton's system and we're just taking, yeah. we're taking all their, their talent. Yeah, well, I mean, Southampton were really good at signing young players, which is why we kept going back there. And I, I remember our old uh, CEO, Ian Eyre, when I think it might have been when we identified uh, uh, van Dijk, I think it was. Mm. Uh, he said, I can't go back and ask them again. <laughs> they, they, I'm not sure they'll uh, pick up the phone. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was unfortunate that it was um, Southampton we were always taking players from. But with Mane, for example, uh, we really liked him when he was at Salzburg. But there was a higher there would be a higher risk signing that player because yeah. he hasn't given quite as much proof that he can do it in the Premier League. So for Liverpool and for other teams as well, there's always this risk reward payoff. Mm -hmm. Do you get a, a real bargain out of Austria? But there's a chance that he might not cut it on the in the Premier League. Mm. Or do you pay a um, higher transfer fee, but with much more evidence that this player can be a top Premier League player, as he'd proven to be at Southampton? The use of data just seems to be in 
going from strength to strength. Where, where do you see it going from from here? Is it going to be, become even more important to managers and uh, scouting networks and directors of football and so on, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think it'll become more important. I think it'll always just be a tool to help, you know, players are people, they're not just data points, so you have to take that personal side into account as well. I think there's lots of underexplored areas. Teamwork is something that hasn't really been answered by data analysis, uh, helping with tactics. And I think um, as more data becomes available, that allows you to do more and more. Mm. So the latest um, data sets, rather than just seeing the position on the pitch where the players are, you get to see 29 locations per player, which is the position of each of their joints. So you can see, are they making a kicking action? Are they back wow. to goal, facing goal? Um, which direction they're looking in? So have they seen the pass that's on? Yeah. All of that is now measured. We haven't started to sort of make analysis out of that yet. But so then I think uh, surely everyone come. will have the same sort of systems at some point, and then you're all looking and shopping in that same sort of market. I'm just thinking, yeah. modern day, it's a modern day, you weren't, you're only there last year, but look at Chelsea, look at Todd Bowley and what they're doing and their data team and signing players and scouting players and giving them 10, 12 year contracts. And what, what do you make of the, the system that they've got in place there at Stamford Bridge? Yeah, so Chelsea's a really interesting uh, case study. They're doing something different. Um, they did some financial engineering with the longer contracts to try and um, try and keep within the new financial fair play rules that, that are coming in. Um, I think, yeah, it's certainly something different from the outside. Uh, it's difficult to really understand the strategy. Mm. The one thing that is underplayed at Chelsea is they've got a very large number of really, really talented and really young players as well. So those players are going to get better in the next mm. couple of years. The challenge that I've got, if I was at Chelsea, um, I'd just look at the number of players if you've got talented young players the way they get better is playing yeah. so the challenge they've got is putting those players on the pitch yeah. giving them enough minutes so that they become the really good players we thought we were ahead of research when we had football manager signing Cherno Samba back in the day so we needed it so we but before we let Ian go we should say where's Jurgen Klopp going because he will know won't he and I wonder if Jurgen Klopp's going to take Ian to his next club whether that's England manager, Germany manager, you know, any, any, has, he, has he kept in touch since you both left? Um, it's been radio silence <laughs> from uh, Jürgen. He's, he's keeping his cards very close to his chest. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth as well, any fans watching, and you know, it, it's, it's fascinating speaking to Ian, but if your club signs a player and you go, what on earth we signed him for? He's only scored four goals and he's... Blah, blah, blah. The, the date has been done and the club will have seen something. There's all this oh, work Jorginho going Ritter's on. Jorginho an example, isn't he? I said yeah. to you like, last season, eight goals in the Championship, 50-odd yeah. games. They've obviously Chelsea seen something are, in him, yeah. Brighton, haven't they? You know? On a road, and the yeah. Chelsea fans are like, what are we yeah. signing him for? But obviously, the, the, these teams are seeing stuff, aren't they? But Ian, yeah, look, good luck with the book, mate. Out um, today. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Remind us the title of the book. It's called How to Win the Premier League. Good. Well, as a Newcastle fan, we've never won anything. I'll be reading Get Eddie it. Howe I'm a sending copy. Eddie Howe a copy and hopefully this is the year. Hep's read it a few times, I think, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Hep didn't need to read it, let's be honest. Yeah, Ian, top man, thank you. Thanks. Good luck with that, Ian. Thanks so much for coming in.